Right. Hello, everybody. Um, it is a real treat and an honor to introduce Evelyn McDonald to you this evening as we celebrate the grand achievement of her magnificent book, The World According to Joan Didion. Like many of you, I am a devoted fan of Evelyn's superb writing and forever impressed with her vision, her dedication to the very necessary art and power of journalism, and quite honestly, her indefatigable energy that is evident in her professorial work as a feminist leader in the classroom and in every project she sets her heart, mind, and physical self to. With signature, pull no punches, investigative passion, and unflappable grace, she is not unlike the beloved subject of her book, Joan Didion. Speaking to a sea of graduating university students in 1975, Joan Didion encouraged the eager crowd to really, quote, live in the world, not just to endure it, not just to suffer it, not just to pass through it, but to live in it, to look at it, to try to get the picture, to live recklessly, to take chances, to make your own work, and to take pride in it, to seize the moment. Well, if anyone I know does exactly that, it is Evelyn McDonald. I remember when she was tapped to write this meditation on Didion and one day stopping by my office, very briefly, because she's always on her way to something, to somewhere, and was in fact on her way that day to Joan Didion's memorial at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. I asked how it was going, and she said she had the remaining chapter sketched out in her head. She was under a tight deadline from her editor, but planned to sit down as much on the page as possible on the flight there. Exhilarating, inspirational, a woman after my own heart. <laughs> About the world, according to Joan Didion, Pulitzer Prize winning author Hua Su said that it is, quote, a wonderful fitting tribute to Joan Didion, approaching the great writer with a force, a probing intelligence, flawless language, and the impulse which drove Didion's finest work to understand the dream of another. George Yachin at California Review of Books notes that, quote, one could read the world according to Joan Didion just to savor the scintillating syntax both Didion's and McDonald's, <laughs> which is why we are here today in keen, concerted admiration of two icons, or rather, rock stars of contemporary <laughs> journalism. <laughs> and on that relevant note, I will tell you that Evelyn McDonald, this is the bio, <clears throat> has written or co-edited eight books, including Women Who Rock, Bessie to Beyonce, Girl Groups to Riot Girl, Queens of Noise, The Real Story of the Runaways, Mama Rama, A Memoir of Sex, Kids, and Rock and Roll, Army of She, Icelandic, Iconoclastic, Irrepressible Bjork, and Rock She Wrote, Women Who Write About Rock, Pop, and Rap. She has been a pop culture writer at the Miami Herald and senior editor at the Village Voice. Her writing has appeared in publications and anthologies, including the New York Times, The Guardian, Los Angeles Times, Ms., and Billboard. A dervish, a devil in the best sense, <laughs> Olivia Rodrigo champion, lover of the wild and natural outdoors, healer of marine life and mammals, ask her about, about volunteering at Marine Mammal Care Center, <laughs> creator of a brand new column focusing on water for Random Lengths newspaper in San Pedro, and newly appointed head of BCLA's MOJ program, Media Arts and a Just Society initiative, ask her about it. <laughs> Evelyn McDonald teaches journalism at Loyola Marymount University and lives with Bug Schenkel in San Pedro, California. Please welcome Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was so nice. That made me a little teary-eyed. Um, <laughs> hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. 
Um, what a great crowd. It's so nice to see students and faculty and administrators and people who I interviewed for the book um, <laughs> and, uh, as well, which is actually Michelle is someone that I interviewed for, for the book uh, that she didn't mention. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, move that. My paper's here. Um, uh, I did just want to make one minor correction in the intro, uh, just I'll get in trouble otherwise. The Majest, uh, Connect um, initiative that I'm directing is actually a collaboration between uh, Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts, the School of Film and Television, and the Communication of Fine Arts, and I'm going to make a plug for the first event that we're doing under my leadership on April 10th. We're having a forum um, on, on the future of journalism called Truth or Consequences. Mm -hmm. Um, and as some of you, many of you journalism students know, and everybody knows, this is all over the news, um, there's been a lot of tumult in the news industry, um, this year particularly, and so we're having some experts, um, journalists, um, entrepreneurs, media scholars, uh, students, um, convening to figure out what's going on and what are, what are the next steps and getting news out to people. So please put that on your calendar, April 10th, 4.30 uh, till 8, which includes a keynote speech, a forum, and a reception. And also hopefully some student uh, films that will be showing in between. So, a uh, little plug for that, looking to the future. Um, I want to thank uh, Rhonda um, and the library in general for having me here. This is my third faculty pub night, which I'm told might be a record. Um, <laughs> they've always been so much fun. I have to say, we started out by having a band play outside for my book about the, the runaways. So we kind of, uh, it was hard to, to top that, but we did have a DJ. Um, the second time, uh, McAllister from KXLU. Uh, for women who rock. Uh, so today, uh, even though Joan Didion is a rock star, it didn't quite feel appropriate to do music, but I did put together a slideshow just for this. I felt um, since this is a educational crowd, which I mostly been speaking more to like bookstores, um, and I thought people might want to know more about how I uh, wrote this book, how I researched this book, in case it's something some of you uh, might want to do in the future, uh, which which I encourage. I've encouraged. So, uh, no DJ, no band, but, but slides. <laughs> um, have not, I have not shown before. Um, so, I want to start by telling you what my book is not. Um, it's not a complete biography of Joan Didion, because it would be a lot bigger than this if it were. Um, and I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Um, Actually, let me just read a few pages from the book. I am going to do a little bit of reading from the book as well as slowing <coughs> slides so you get a taste of what it's about. Um, and I think these pages uh, help explain what it, what it is um, and, why it, and partly why it's not a biography. Okay. Uh, this is from the second chapter notebook. Can and can you all hear me? Okay. okay. Contextualizing Didion's ongoing resonance with multiple generations of dreamers and memers was one of the goals for this book. But I also wanted to dig beneath the hype to the actual work that inspired it and reconnect that work to the extraordinary life of the woman who created it. I did not intend to write an exhaustive biography. Tracy Dougherty did an excellent job of that with The Last Love Song in 2015, and that is a big, thick book, <laughs> if that's uh, what you're looking for. Um, and until the rest of her papers are ready for public viewing, Exhausted is still in the offing. And, and by that I mean that um, uh, her, after her death, her papers, her journals, letters, all kinds of papers, um, were donated to, or not donated, they, the New York Public Library probably paid a hefty sum of money <laughs> for them, um, but they are not ready for public viewing. Um, her papers and her husband's and her son's, since she was the last surviving member of that family. Um, so you can't really, the biographies are going to have to wait until there's access to those. That said, as we'll talk about, um, many of there are papers that she donated to the Bancroft Library in Berkeley um, up until I have it later in my speech. I think it took 2008 papers, manuscripts of her earlier books up to after Henry. Um, so there there were manuscripts I went through, and you'll see some of those. Um, 
So what I wanted to do with this book, without access to those papers, uh, was instead was trace Divian's legacy in the wake of her death and map the narrative of her life by visiting the places she lived and wrote about. Along the way, I talked to many of the people who knew her best, family, friends, co-workers, fans. This is not Joan's complete story. It is more of a notebook, trying to remember what it was for her to be her at different places and different times. I am fascinated by the ways in which she changed from the Sacramento-bred Goldwater Republican to the Upper East Side liberal, from a proud daughter of pioneers to the first serious white writer to stand up for the falsely accused defendants in the Central Park rape case. Call it Joan's Ark. That's with a C. <laughs> in my travels through pages and places, I discovered a person who was so much more than the small woman in giant sunglasses whose work went far beyond hippies and rock stars and Santa Ana winds, who beautifully but relentlessly laid bare the fictions we tell ourselves in order, and each other, in order to live. And that's a reference to her favorite quote, tell each other, we tell each other, tell stories in order to live. Um, like the notebook, this story proceeds in a fragmented style. As Joan's writing did, it embodies to some degree the atomization she prophesized. It is not a narrative log of events, it is more like an associative legend for a map, with each chapter named after a figure that figured after an object that figured large in Didion's imaginary, gold, snake, hotel, orchid. And so each chapter, like I say, has single titles, and then there's these really cute little illustrations by Ann Munches. Um, and then the illustrations are all, um, as well as some extra ones that aren't elsewhere in the book, are gathered on the end papers. So if nothing else, buy the book for the end papers. <laughs> Come for the end papers and hopefully enjoy what's in between. Um, I really love those. Okay. Um, it leaps around across space and time. Occasionally, I insert myself into the narrative. Joan could be a very informed and partial writer, but one of the keys to her appeal is the way she often personalized her work. For her, pe for her first piece, for Life Magazine, she wrote not about the war in Vietnam, as she had wanted to do, but her editor wouldn't send her because, quote, the guys were already, already covering it. Instead, she wrote that she was in the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in, Haw in Honolulu, quote, in lieu of filing for divorce. I tell you this not as aimless revelation, but because I want you to know, as you read me, precisely who I am, and where I am, and what is on my mind. So that's a little snippet of what I was trying to do in the book, and also what I, some of the things that I think are really important about Joan. Um, and that, that really strong narrative voice, that very personal, Voice, making herself vulnerable, also very specific, very imagistic, writing a lot about place um, and, and other things. Um, uh, so that said, while this isn't a complete biography and um, uh, it's shorter and it is kind of um, episodic, I like that um, Michelle called it meditations. I did also do a lot of research for this book. I didn't, uh, you know, it started with reading and rereading um, Joan's work, which was voluminous. I mean, not just her books um, and the collections of her work, but also finding many articles online. We'll look at some of those um, in, in digital archives or um, speeches that haven't been published, as well as the many, many articles that have been written about Joan Didion, right? She's such a journalist, 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 loved to write about her. I can't say, I did not read everything written about her by any means, and I'm still sometimes finding articles. I wish I'd found that one before I tried to read everything that she wrote, but I'm sure I did not succeed at that either. But I think I found, I think I read, read everything that was published in a book, um, and then quite a few things that, that were not. Um, I'll show you some one of those. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the various kinds of research I did to, and that one does to write, and even a biography that's not a biography, to write this kind of book. Um, and you know, the most important thing, because I was really trying to, um, in a sense, put myself in her shoes and try to see the world as she saw it, so it's called The World According to Joan Didion, um, I did travel to many of the places that 
she lived, she worked, she wrote about. Um, if you go to the first slide, where's... Sorry. All right. Uh, okay. Um, so, and some of that travel didn't, I didn't have to go that far, <laughs> because she did live in Los Angeles, and that's really where she first came uh, to fame, was writing Slouching Towards Bethlehem, writing, writing about Los Angeles with her husband, John Gregory Dunn, for the Saturday Evening Post, writing a column called Points West, um, among other publications. Um, and she lived here from 1964 to 1988. Uh, so, so a lot of the work was right here, and, and I have to say that one of the reasons you know, I discovered Joan when I was an undergraduate in college, and a teacher assigned her uh, some dreamers of the golden dream for me to read, and my mind was was blown. Right? Um, I also did, you know, in the native California. I was born here. Um, my dad was born here. My grandfather was born here. So I also always really related to Joan as someone who had then moved away, but felt very connected to my California roots. So part of this for me was also having spent 40 years of my life not living in California and having come back here, reconnecting with some of my own roots. Um, so these are two of the places that she lived in, in California. On the, that, my right, the far right, is the Hardin Guest House, um, which is in Palos Verdes uh, on the peninsula. It's the first place that she lived in, that she moved in in 1964. Um, it's, uh, Part, it was actually just the gatehouse. I'm sorry, it's the gatehouse, not the guest house. It was just the gatehouse for the Vanderlip estate, which was the estate that settled in Palos Verdes, um, that then became a residential. They rented that when she and her husband moved here. Um, it has a spectacular view of the ocean. It's on the cliffs overlooking the, the water. And you can hike right around there. So um, I took this picture. I was not. Uh, you know, breaking the law or anything. I did not. Have, I was on a public uh, path. There are paths that you can walk around, and Abalone Cove is just over there. So you can actually walk around here to Abalone Cove. It's really beautiful. It's like 20 minutes from here. I highly recommend it if you have never been um, in in that area. Um, Abalone Cove has, has amazing tide pools. And you can swim in the cave that she writes about in the year of magical thinking that John Gregory Dunn taught her to swim through. You, you know, you can still like go through this passage. Um, that's that little steeple up there is the Wayfarer Chapel, the Lloyd Wright's Glass Chapel, which actually just closed a few weeks ago because of the shifting um, soil there from from all the rain. It's always shifting there. It's just, you know, <laughs> seismic area, the road is in, insane <laughs> driving through there and that's been closed a lot lately and, and she, she wrote about, she wrote about driving those roads and opening that, the big gate. Um, so they lived there for two years and then they adopted their only child, Quintana Rue Dunn, the baby and the baby and the, the nanny were living with them and the landlord was like, no, you can't have um, this many people here, because he was actually living there too, um, and so they moved and they temporarily were in Brentwood for a little bit, then they moved back to Brentwood later, but, and then they moved to this house on Franklin Avenue in Los Feliz, so they were um, in the middle of the sort of rock and roll, Hollywood um, uh, movie scene of the late 60s. This is where they had the very famous parties for Tom Wolfe's electric Kool-Aid acid test. Um, Janis Joplin um, was there, and um, so that was their sort of hippie effort center. Um, and that's when she, that's when she really came to fame, was when they lived there, watching towards Bethlehem in 1968. I guess I should be talking with the mic, sorry. Okay. Go back home. I'll go back. Um, so uh, these are some of the places locally that I visited, as well as going up to Brentwood and Malibu, where they also lived. Um, these are some of the other, well, she, that's the Upper East Side, that building that she lived in, um, in until she died with John Gregory Dunn. She, uh, so I went to New York and did quite a bit of research, too. She actually lived in New York City longer than she lived in any other city in the United States. Everybody thinks, or anywhere in the world, um, and they never really lived outside of 
U.S. Uh, she was very much an American writer. That was, that was her subject. Um, or, or at least our, the hemisphere, or the global south, the Pacific Rim. Um, so that's uh, the condo which was for sale. I don't know. Then they dropped the price. I, don't know. <laughs> um, I forget which floor it is, but it's one of the corners there. Um, and then this is the Royal Hawaiian Hotel where she, you know, wrote about finally, finally her story in lieu of a divorce in a room there. So I did go also and stay at the Royal Hawaiian. Um, Hawaii, I think, was her favorite place in the world. It's, she just loved it there. I mean, she was someone who really did love the ocean. She thought about um, being a marine scientist. Um, and I, I think that's where she got a sense of, of peace. So that was a little hardship to have to stay. It was a financial hardship, I will say, to stay at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. And I only did it for a couple nights, and then I went and stayed with my friend and her partner. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was pretty cool. Um, so those are, uh, did I say anything I want to say about that? Um, and then I also went to um, uh, Sacramento, right, which is where she was born and grew up. And uh, these are two of the houses that she lived in there. Um, first, the one on uh, the right. Actually, no, that's, well, I think this is actually might be where her, um, uh, one of her grandparents lived. Um, and then actually, and the one on the left, the big fancy one, which she called the birthday cake, mm -hmm. uh, was actually owned by her grandmother, um, Genevieve Didion. She was a grand dame of Sacramento Society, a member of the school board for decades. And that they, her family did live there when she was a teenager for several years. Uh, and it's, it's known as the Didion House. Her, her parents never actually owned it, it apparently. Um, I get this from her cousin. So it's a, it, it, Genevieve Didion owned it. And many Didions did live there um, <laughs> along the way. So, um, so as I was traveling, especially in Sacramento, uh, I not only visited these places and tried to uh, understand, and I did have to say, like, you see something like that, you go, okay, this is her view of the world. I actually kind of fell in love a little bit with Sacramento. I had never been there. It's a really beautiful city, the big wide avenues and the trees and the delta of uh, the river outside of it. She wrote so much about swimming in the rivers and I understood why when I went up there, the Sacramento and American rivers up there are huge. Um, whales have gone up <laughs> the river before. Um, so, you, you know, I did feel like I got a deeper understanding of her by seeing where she had been. Um, and then I also got a deep understanding by talking to people in these places and interviewing people who knew her, um, whether they were, I interviewed three of her cousins, I interviewed her nephew, Griffin Dunn, who made the documentary. Um, I interviewed uh, people who knew her socially, uh, such as Joan Quinn, who is here and is a writer as well. Um, so thank you for being here, Joan. Um, another Joan. Um, and also uh, Stacy Stukin, also another LA writer. And Michelle, Stacy and Michelle actually were classmates of Quintana Rudon, of uh, their daughter, of Joan and Joan's daughter, at uh, Westlake High School here. Um, as well as all of us being fans and influenced by her. Uh, and I interviewed. Oh, I'm just going to Okay. Um, oh, so this is a <laughs> photograph that um, her cousin Julia Armstrong Totten. Uh, let me use for the book. I love this photo. I actually think that this is, so she was about um, eight years old in that photo. She was eight years old in that photo. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she, this, I actually thought that this was maybe taken in Sacramento. We actually have decided, when I went to Sacramento, people were like, no, 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 that's not our foliage. <laughs> I think it was when she was in Colorado, um, when her father was stationed with the military, because it was during the war. Uh, but she very she wrote a lot about being when they were stationed in Colorado. It's a very traumatic time for her. It's when she started getting migraines. It's also when she fell in love with John Wayne. 
Um, <laughs> so that's also true. Um, and uh, also in Sacramento, I went to the Kilgore Cemetery, which is her family's their ancestral cemetery. Her family, her, her ancestors on both sides of her family came during the middle of the 19th century, during the Gold Rush era, from other parts of the United States. They were colonizers, uh, settlers, part of the Americans that were um, trying to find new opportunities in, uh, in California, um, including being driven by the Gold Rush. Uh, and there's a whole cemetery not the whole cemetery is their family, but it's called the Kilgore Cemetery. And I interviewed two of her cousins sitting in that cemetery and having them tell me the lore, which was pretty amazing, actually. Um, I also interviewed uh, friends of hers and her college boyfriend, Robert Widener, um, who uh, they went to Berkeley. They actually met in Sacramento, they were both in Sacramento, and then they went to Berkeley together. Uh, and he took this photograph of her in San Francisco, which she used when she applied for the um, Vogue Prix de Paris mm -hmm. competition. She sent them this photo. He said she, oh, she made, she did actually, uh, she made the coat that she's wearing um, herself, which is pretty amazing. Um, after I wrote the book, he sent me a letter that she wrote to him confirming that he took this photo and that she made the dress and all this. It was such a sweet letter. That was, um, so in addition to interviewing people um, and traveling to places, I also did do archival research in libraries, right? The importance of libraries. I really wanted to make sure to talk about that. Uh, today, right? Because it's something um, I started doing as an undergraduate in college, and is now kind of one of one of my things that I love to do when doing a book is just to like go dig in some archives and find um, obscure papers <laughs> and to dig through Joan, the original manuscripts for <coughs> Run River, Play It As It Lays, you know, After Henry, all, all these works. Uh, see. Um, handwritten notes, handwritten by Joan, on them, and and you can actually do this. I didn't need anything. I just needed an ID. I didn't even have to because California is a public university. Anybody can go in and do this. You have to make an appointment, and you have to be careful. And at, I have to say, at Bancroft, they're pretty severe. <laughs> they're pretty like uh, they don't make you feel really comfortable, but. Technically, you, you can go in and do this. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that. Um, but I did spend um, many uh, afternoons going through these. And, and among the things that I found were um, uh, some speeches that she had given at Berkeley, particularly this one, at, um, The California Woman, which I write about in the book which was really, and these were sort of um, lodestones of information for seeing how Joan developed her ideas and sort of, she worked ideas out in speaking to students that she would then later put into articles and books. And also she was doing, I think, this thing of really trying to um, nurture and pass on what she had learned, and particularly to women, and I saw this a lot in her work, her supporting other writers, um, often women, her supporting Julia Armstrong Totten, her um, cousin that gave me that photo. Um, she never taught, I, she was very, I never met her, but everybody tells me that she was very shy um, and awkward <laughs> in person. Um, Joan can, is nodding her head. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, which, as am I, uh, but makes it hard to be a teacher. Um, but she did, I think, um, in, in these speeches, and, and um, Michelle quoted one before, I'm actually gonna read uh, about that, part of that speech as well. It's her famous 1975 Riverside speech. Um, so let me read just a little bit um, about and this is a little bit more, uh, this is from the first chapter of the book, actually. Um, one of the things that 
Janine talked a lot about was writing and how to write and why it was important to her. I think that's also one of the reasons I have such a strong attachment to her, especially writers and creatives, because she was so transparent about um, her own process and, her, and why she wrote. Um, so let me just, and I guess the other thing I should set this up with, um, well, let me just read this. Uh, this is from, you know, I talk about her famous uh, essay, why, uh, why I Write. Um, where's she um, She empowers us and she warns us. Stories can be lies. We live entirely, especially if we are writers, by the imposition of a narrative line upon disparate images. Ideas with which we have learned to freeze the shifting phantasmagoria, which is our actual experience, she says in her book, The White Album. Narrative was her expertise and her enemy. We live in an age of reckonings over who gets to tell stories and how and why. Didion faced this abyss as a young woman beginning her career and her family, and her transparency about this dissolution was her and our saving grace. Quote, I've had to struggle against all my life against my own apprehensions, my own false ideas, my own distorted perceptions, she said in a commencement address at the University of California, Riverside in 1975. I've had to work very hard, make myself unhappy, give up ideas that made me comfortable, trying to apprehend social reality. I've spent my entire adult life, it seems to me, in a state of profound culture shock. I wish I were unique in this, but I'm not. So I just love that her like, and you know, she she grew up, this, you know, daughter of the pioneers. Uh, her parents, you know, very much part of the um, society of Sacramento, um, native sons of the Golden West, and uh, she eventually came to really reject that whole depiction of. California as this golden land and to have a much like deeper and more complicated understanding of it. Um, and she really spent years struggling with how to write about that and finally wrote about it in her book, Where I Was From. She wrote about it in pieces and essays um, in the California Woman essay. Um, and then after her, both of her parents had died, she just came out um, and was like, wow pretty much walked away from her own inheritance, her legacy. Um, Jidine expressed many of her foundational concepts first in speeches like these, mostly at universities to younger audiences. This is part of what has made her legacy so transformative for multiple generations. She was literally speaking to us, passing on what she had learned. It takes an act of will to live in the world, which is what I'm talking about today. By living in the world, I mean really trying to see it, at, look at it, trying to make connections. And that's not easy, it takes work. You have to keep stripping yourself down, examining everything you see, getting rid of whatever is blinding you. Then she offered this advice. Throw yourself into the convulsion of the world. Um, and I have to say, if I could, had to give one piece of advice <laughs> to my students, to uh, any f future journalist, right, or arts maker, or, or any a human being uh, trying to navigate the world, uh, throw yourself into the convulsion of the world. Um, okay, so let me show you a few more things. How are we doing on time? Not doing okay. I'm doing okay. All right. Um, so. Um, I also found letters to and from Joan. This is actually a letter that I didn't find again until after I wrote the book, that when I went to Texas on the book tour, I um, went into Lois Wallace, the Lois Wallace papers at the University of Texas uh, Library Ransom Center. Lois Wallace was Joan's agent for many, many years. And this is a letter actually that her husband wrote to Christopher Lehman Hopped, who was a reviewer for the New York Times, and it was an angry husband letter <laughs> um, uh, about 
Christopher Lehman Hobbs had written this thing criticizing Joan for wearing a sheer dress in her author photo <laughs> on Democracy, and then the, the cover of Democracy. Um, he wrote this New York Times column crit criticizing Joan and Gloria Steinem for Gloria Steinem's picture of being in, in a bubble bath, and essentially like slut shaming, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, it's kind of amazing in 1984. Uh, and so this was John's like, don't you say this about my wife letter, uh, he, which I don't think he sent because in the files it says, um, as you said to, you know, to, to Lois, the agent, for your eyes only, or it goes no further than this. I, think it, this is what it says. I don't think this ever got sent, but there's some, in, um, there's things in it that I haven't seen elsewhere, such as um, him saying that she had gynecologic problems since she was in college and didn't wear underwear. Um, and that she'd had a hysterectomy uh, that re around that time, or like in 83, which are things that I haven't seen talked about elsewhere. So I, I still, like, I can't stop doing the research for the book, <laughs> even though it's done. Maybe the stuff will get in the paperback. Um, okay. Some more. Uh, so I also did. Um, some our research in the digital archives, right? Finding in um, ProQuest, I think this one was yeah, from ProQuest. articles. This is her famous on self-respect that you know many people have read. Read that's in her first book, Slouching Towards Bethlehem. That was one of her first columns for Vogue magazine. Um, that I think is uh, a lot of young people have seen it as the kind of you know, how to have self-esteem. Um, when, you know, back in the days of Pinterest and Tumblr, this probably was like the second most posted <laughs> essay ever, I think. Um, and, uh, and then I found, and I have, to, oh, I have to shout out my research assistants, Tyler Rowland and uh, Maude Bascom Duong, who helped me find some of um, these things online in particular. Uh, so this is from one of the columns that she wrote for the Saturday Evening Post. She and John alternated columns. Um, so this one I thought was really interesting because it was written in 1968 about her reaction to police violence against uh, young protesters or just young hippies um, and people of color, um, which I'd never seen anthologized and I thought was very, a side of Joan that we don't always see, right? I feel like sometimes her public image has been very curated by her editors, mm. um, especially now since her death. Um, so uh, I thought this was a very, again, and then she, you know, again, her saying, I grew up thinking that, you know, cops were on our side, and um, I, I don't feel that way anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's like, and this is in the Saturday, and this is like, yeah. mage, this is a, a Saturday Evening Post was a very mainstream magazine um, that was widely yeah. read, Time, Newsweek, and Saturday Evening Post. Um, um, and then this, what, um, we also spent time in, uh, uh, Tyler Rowland uh, assisted me at the New York Public Library, um, which is where Didine's papers will eventually be <laughs> made public. Um, but there are uh, there were many other papers of interest there, particularly the uh, archives of the New York Review of Books, which is a paper that Joan wrote for for many years. I actually, and some of her most interesting work was for the New York Review of Books including her article on the Central Park rape case, called, which is called Sentimental Journeys. Um, and there were many versions of this art article, many notes written back and forth between her editor um, and, and Joan, uh, Bob Silvers, the editor of the New York Review of Books, uh, back and forth. It was really fascinating to watch them argue about whether to reveal the jogger's name um, and whether she was, you know, being too hard on on the district attorneys or um, too hard on um, the, the press, right? 
Um, I'm going to read a little bit about from that part, and then I'm going to stop. Right? We're going to take questions. Um, uh, and this really talks about her uh, the importance of her journalism at this stage in her life. The chapter is called Jogger. Beginning in the 1980s, Joan Didion did for the New York Review book what women reporters had rarely been allowed to do when she began her career decades earlier, when they were confined to fashion magazines or research departments. She covered campaigns and conventions, presidents and vice presidents. In 1968, she had written about Ronald Reagan's wife Nancy, back when he was governor of California, and in 1977, her topic was the empty mansion he built on the outskirts of Sacramento. In 1989, she took on the president himself. The Reagan article, Life at Court, is a think piece reflecting, I know, on the legacy of his two terms based on recent books. But the year prior, Didion did weeks of legwork, not just brain work, covering the presidential primary in California and the Democratic and Republican conventions in Atlanta and New Orleans. Her resulting article, Insider Baseball, analyzed the deep disconnect she experienced between both parties and the people they are supposed to represent. The candidates, she wrote, she barely deigned to speak George Bush's and Michael Dukakis's names, <laughs> tend to speak a language common in Washington, but not specifically shared by the rest of us. <clears throat> Robert Shear, the LA-based uh, journalist, still around, who I also interviewed for this book, um, <coughs> traveled with Didion as part of the press crew on these campaigns. At the time, he was a reporter for the Los Angeles Times and an outspoken contrarian journalist himself. He found his colleague to be a fierce and fearless road warrior. The times that I was alone with Joan traveling, I didn't think of her as frail, he says. I thought of her as quite feisty and capable of surviving quite well, and having a sharp eye, and also keeping up the schedule that was even more exhausting at times than I wanted to do. <coughs> what I loved about Joan was she had none of the pain in the ass qualities. <laughs> the know-it-all, I can figure this out in 15 minutes arrogance that a lot of journalists had. I know exactly what he's talking about there. Um, she always felt there was a lot to learn. Uh, which, I, again, I think is uh, a great piece of advice, is that one of the joys of being a, a journalist, uh, being a writer, but I think particularly of being a journalist, uh, is that you're always learning, you're always trying to find out new things, taking on new subjects, the world is always changing, and you need to keep up. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I learned from, from Joan Gideon. Joan Gideon. So thank you. That was great to uh, see some of the uh, great photographs just on a bigger screen. I love that. And I would like to say that the illustrations for each chapter really are awesome. Um, thank you. Very I, I great actually, choice. I had the same illustrator do the poster for our Future of Journalism oh. event, too. So she's, she's great. She's based in Brooklyn. Yeah. Really good. So I, I invite all of you to look at the book and look at the chapters, each of the wonderful chapters with the amazing little sketches. Um, okay, so um, Joan Didion seems like someone who was both intensively private and intensively public at the same time. Would you say that that's true? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a weird <laughs> contradiction. She was very shy. Um, of her, what I can tell, and also interviews that I've seen, um, and yet she also lived very publicly. She loved to throw parties. They, she and John loved to have people over. They loved to dine out, to be seen in public. Um, but she also, her, you know, she had her husband there as a kind of foil and a kind of protection. And I think Joan could also talk about. Joan uh, attended many of, of of those parties. So she was someone that I talk to about this, um, and her husband was very, was the opposite in, in terms of being very outgoing, right, um, a raconteur, boisterous even. <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, okay, yeah. <laughs> one of the ones that Shira was complaining about, probably. Um, her husband was a very successful writer as well, but not, of the, not quite of the stature of, of, of Joan. So I always think when I was reading it and she, reading about the parties, I was always imagining her kind of off to the side and just like watching people and listening. Yes, Jim's not, Jim yeah. is, is nodding. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, she, you know, she said that one of her techniques was to 
um, make herself in, invisible and to, for people to forget that she was there um, and, and, also, and to spend, you know, blab. Um, or, and also just to, um, if it's not, to, just to stop talking and so people would talk nervously over <laughs> her silence. Okay. And so um, how did this come through in some of the interviews you did with her close friends and family? the two parts of her? Um, well, I, I think one thing that I found was that for the people that she did let in past her reserve and into her circle. her circle, she was then very, could be very warm um, and caring and um, in inclusive and, uh, I mean, I'm not like John was, but she, um, she was very loving, and I saw that in some of the letters, like the letters that uh, Bob Widener showed me, um, that she was actually, you know, and they would send Christmas letters, right? Like, I know, I, I think there's a way in which she was very scary and severe, and she um, was really tough, um, but I think there was a side of her that was also very uh, caring, right? And, and obviously, she kept friends all her life. Which is, you know. She yes, she a, had some very strong friendships that, uh, and like Gian Moore, someone that I interviewed, Brianne Moore's uh, widow, um, uh, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, she was Katrina's <coughs> mom, Jean Stein, the writer, they were very good friends. Uh, and, they're, and they're also like famous people, like, they're all very famous people, like Nora Ephron yes. was wow. one of her uh, close friends. Um, yeah, she traveled in pretty rarefied circles. Yeah. Um, so at one point you did mention emailing uh, Andrew Bird, um, for some of you might not know, but you could tell us in a minute. Um, can you talk more about Didion's influence on contemporary music? Yeah, there's been a weird thing in the last few, uh, several years. I mean, as part of why we, we actually started, as my editor and my agent and I were talking about like there should be a book on Joan Didion, like why is she having this like pop cultural um, appeal when she was in her 80s, like what what is it about this woman that, you know, um, she's a Tumblr, you know, meme or whatever, um, and then she died, right, and they were like, okay, now, we're, like, we should do it now, um, uh, and, and I think partly, be, you know, because of her death and she, there were so many obituaries, she was on cover of three magazines in, within six months after her death. Um, uh, she really seeped even more into popular culture, and so Andrew Bird has two songs about her on um, his uh, Inside Problems album. Um, he's a, a songwriter and a violinist. Um, uh, he's in a, what might be, what did he, what is he just, he was just in some movie, anyways. Um, and Blonde Redhead named their latest album after her and have songs about her. Um, Olivia Rodrigo, All American Bitch, is from a line in a John Didion line in Slashing Towards Bethlehem from the article Slashing Towards Bethlehem. Phoebe Bridgers has talked about <laughs> Kim Gordon has talked about like um, and she was kind of a rock star, right? She she wrote about the Doors. She inter she wrote about Joan Didion. Um, I mean, she wrote, about, she wrote about Joan Baez, all the Jones. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and she was also very fashionable. She loved fashion. She worked for Vogue. She, working for Vogue was also, I think, how she learned to present herself and how to pose for photos. And she said this, that she went to all these photo shoots for Vogue magazine working as an editorial assistant. And she, she wrote a whole article about, like, watching how women were posed um, and how the camera treated women. I'm very self-aware of that. And, I, I, and you know, she not only is her writing iconic, but she herself is iconic, right? Those photos, and you know, she was, she was a beautiful woman, um, very small and uh, blonde and, um, but not necessarily, I mean, not voluptuous or, you know, not someone, would you post? You'd wear like, uh, you know, long sleeves and, um, yeah. I think that she she also has become like a fashion. And then you know she was amused, mm -hmm. and, and she there was the the ad 
where she um, had the glasses, yeah, her, her big glasses, yeah. right, and she, when she was 80. She was cool. <laughs> You know, she's, she was literally cool, uh, <laughs> like cool as a cucumber. And yes, in many ways. Also <laughs> iconic, yes. Yeah. So uh, we have to ask, um, Joan's mother was a librarian. <laughs> How do you think that that played into her identity and her, her life's work? I think, well, the, the most fundamental thing was that it was her mother who gave her a notebook when she was five years old, right. when she was bothering her mother and her mother had just had, um, gave birth to her brother. And her mother said, here, here's a notebook, um, go amuse yourself. <laughs> um, and that's how Joan started writing. And she wrote a short story immediately. Um, and she basically never really, really stopped. Um, so I think that appreciation of, of writing. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that there was, there were books in the house that she grew up. Although, uh, you know, her parents didn't seem to, care much about yeah. there's you know famous passage that she got rejected by Stanford uh, which was the only school that she applied to yeah. right the only college she was so sure of herself and then she got rejected um, and so then she had to send out other applications and then had to, she actually started at Cal a semester late because right. of that or a quarter late I guess well, Cal was on semester yeah it was semester that's the one that um, anyways uh, but, and her dad was like, uh, I don't care. So, so, so you don't, you know, too bad. Uh, so you don't go to college. Um, yeah. I kind of, I kind of wondered if, I imagine her and like her office as like, you know, research, so much research that she probably did. I like to think that her librarian DNA was, was working. That's, that is, that is probably true, yes. She was a very deep researcher, and, and they read, they read all the time. They had um, books everywhere, um, and they read the newspapers, um, and they each had their own offices, and they would uh, call each other, um, to or call out to each other, or literally call each other on the phone and say, oh, you have to read this. Or, Reading to each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so we're just going to assign that, you know, it's her DNA that made her such a great writer. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that there, that you mentioned a lot of photographs in your work, different times, different photos, and we've seen some of them, but only a small selection were in the book. And I just wondered what made you, was this a deliberate choice? Was there like copyright issues or um, licensing issues? We just, because again, it wasn't like a straightforward bio. Mm. Um, and also, um, we weren't doing the glossy pages for good photo reproduction, right? So that's, we did the illustrations instead because they, you know, show up better on, on those page. I mean, I like the photos that we've got, but they're not, it's not glossy paper, right? right. So, um, and we, we, I, I actually wanted to have one more photo, but also, um, we needed to have vertical photos, and there were some <laughs> photos that I wanted that weren't vertical. Uh, we did end up going with one horizontal, but they should have all been vertical. Uh, there was a photo that I wish um, that I found too late that I wish we had had used. Um, and and yes, they are some of the photos are also very expensive yeah, um, at this point, but that wasn't necessarily. Um, and what's coming out of my pocket? Um, <laughs> but it, uh, we we felt like we had the different periods of Joan covered. Yeah, yeah. and um, we weren't doing it as a as a photo book in that way. And I love the one with um, where she's got holding her little little hat, little brown hat, the pills of like silk hat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so cool. That was a great photo. Um, can you talk about your research process? I feel like I did, but yeah, you did. But, but, but do you, do you write longhand? Do you, oh, you know? How, I mean, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Well, one thing I should say is that one thing that I did, and you can see it on the book. I don't know. If I'll show. You, I'll show you that. Um, because I was reading, you know, all these books, I used these color co coded post-its. Yeah. Can you see it? <laughs> and I also have the highlights. And this is yeah. this is just color coded for my. This is for my readings, but her books, I did the same thing, and I had them color-coded by, you know, snake was red, 
uh, Orchid, which is the last chapter, it was green. Um, so when I would find passages that uh, had one of, the, one of the themes that I was, and, and I, these grew as I was reading, um, I mean, I had a sort of list of ideas in the beginning, and it wasn't necessarily the same list of chapters that ended up in the book, but I would highlight or tag those pages with the color-coded, so yeah, um, and a lot of sticking um, quotes up on the wall of my office, or articles that I liked, and... Because um, there was uh, a lot to go through, and a lot that you were dealing with. And yeah. I'm always amazed at, at, at people who can be so well organized. I, I also, I mean, a lot of it was on my, especially because I was traveling. Yeah. So I had to have it on my computer, and I was trying to keep it um, organized. Uh, and actually, I did okay, because when I was looking for some of these pictures, I actually found them more quickly than I thought I would have. Been. Oh, I did lots of little float folders. I forgot about those. Um, so yeah, so that I could have access, because I was traveling and writing, and yeah, as Michelle told the Andy, like writing on the plane, which by the way was a Joan did, you know, in her famous list of her travel oh, list, her packing list, right? Which is one of, again, one of those like things I could post it on Instagram a lot. Um, one of the things was tr a typewriter. She traveled with a typewriter. Um, obviously, this was pre laptops. Um, and she and she and she said one of the reasons she did was not necessarily on the airplane, but. <coughs> in the airport, right. waiting for the planes, she would, um, yeah. having done an interview, she would immediately start typing up her notes. Yeah, that was one of the chapters of the really typewriter. Yeah, yes. Really <laughs> the typewriter is one of the chapters. Um, so, so you've written and, and or co-edited eight books. How did this book differ from those? Well, as, as we were reading the list of my books, it doesn't have a subtitle, <laughs> which is good. I'm like, I don't want any more subtitles in my books. It makes it shorter. Um, uh, it's actually the, one, one of the shorter books that I've written. Um, uh, and most of my other books have been about musicians, right? right? So um, it's... And even though I think of her as a rock star and connected to the world of, of culture, and um, she's a writer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and I'm kind of glad about that. Like, I feel like I've written a lot about music and, and women, and mm -hmm. it, was, it was nice to sort of go down another path, and I'll probably next time go down uh, another path as well. And that leads me to my next question, which is, what is next? Um, well, I, you know, it, I'm not sure yet. Um, I, I think uh, Michelle mentioned I'm starting uh, a column for the local newspaper in San Pedro, which is called Random Links, which is a longshoreman term, mm -hmm. um, which is a, an old school, 43-year-old um, independent alternative newspaper published a, like once a month, not a weekly. Um, so a, a rarity, um, very progressive paper, very small paper, but um, aren't they all these days? Um, so I'm writing about people and their relationships to water. So I'm, I'm you know, I, Joan wanted to be a marine scientist uh, at some point, so I'm sort of following in that maybe path also of um, writing that's, about that's a, water. That's a nice different aspect though, you know, yeah. usually when we hear about water it's always conservation, you know, and, and but that's a nice, yeah, personal. Yeah, yeah, it's so more of like an ethnography because we have to understand our relationship to the environment, and yeah. I always think of nature writing should be about people too. Because otherwise, you know, we're, I think that's wonderful. It's, it's escapism. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I would like to end this part now because I know there are questions in the audience, and I want to make sure that we do have time for that. So um, I'm going to ask my team here. Do we have any uh, questions? Oh, good. When were you at the Village Voice, and what did that? How did that play out? And you I started writing for the Village Voice and um, moved to New York in '88. Pretty much, I think so. '89. Uh, I and then I started working there as actually I started by working as a copy editor, um, a freelance copy editor, and then I started writing for them right around the same time, and then I worked my way up to being um, the music editor 
in 96, um, senior editor of music. Um, and then I left, um, and, but I still continued to write for them uh, for really up, up until like 15 years ago or so. Um, and I had been at Alternative Weeklies before that, uh, at the new paper in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, so I very much, and, and at the San Francisco Weekly as well, um, I really liked those Alternative Weeklies. Um, and the Village Voice, there's actually a book about the Village Voice that just came out called um, The Freaks Came Out to Write. And the author of that, Trisha, I'm going to just keep plugging my event, but um, <laughs> Trisha Romano, the author of that book, is going to be speaking at the Future of Journalism Forum talking about that book. Um, so uh, if you're interested in The Voice, you should definitely come see her speak. Um, it was an incredible training ground because it was a writer's newspaper. And so the editors would sit with you and go over every word, and it wasn't like you would turn in your copy and they would like, you know, mark it up and then publish it, or, you know, change it and publish it. Like, you had approval over every change made to your article, and they had to go over it with you because it was the, a voice, right? It was supposed to be the voice of the writer. So that was incredibly freeing and liberating, but but. Um, the writers, the editors also acted as, as like mentors and teachers. It was like the best writing school. Um, they were also like a lot of them were jerks. And um, it was, you know, yes, it was very, it was a, it was a pretty sexist environment. Um, it, 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 um, even though there were also great writers like Ellen Willis there and Cindy Carr, um, there was a lot of conflict uh, between different writers. The book is full of. Um, a lot of great stories, <laughs> by the way. I highly, it's an oral history, I highly recommend it. Um, I mean, it was definitely the most significant publication I ever worked for. I, um, the Miami Herald was also great in its way, but it wasn't the same kind of training ground that the voice was. And also having, um, for all you know, the problems that there were there, you know, it was also a, a place where so many important writers got to write about feminism and, and you know, was the crucible for gay rights with um, so many writers, uh, Jill Johnston and Richard Goldstein, um, as well as important black writers like Greg Tate and um, <coughs> Cooper. Um, yeah, it was pretty incredible. I mean, I worked, you know, <coughs> next to Colson Whitehead, uh, oh, double wow. now, two times Jeez. Pulitzer Prize winner, James Hanahan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really, Um, Hello. Wait, so, uh, go, sorry. Go, go, go. Uh, I'm a student down south of Orange County, and I'm a transfer student, so I've applied here to LMU, and last night I just got accepted. And Yay, I wrote, congratulations! And, you know, I only applied here because of you. Oh. I wrote, um, <laughs> and I wrote you in my um, one of my personal statements uh, oh to God. here. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so I've been waiting to talk to you, so thank you for having us today. Um, with your world, revolving around Joan Didion and understanding her research and her and her mind and the atmosphere and her journalistic viewpoint. Has that influenced you at all uh, with your teaching and how to help and empower students to solve solutions with their writings? Um, that's a really good question. I'm so <laughs> glad. Thank you so much for your kind words and I'm so glad that you're coming. Congratulations. I hope you're coming. Um, uh, and obviously you'll do great because you asked some great questions. I think that um, her sort of relentlessness and, and never um, letting up on herself and, and questioning her own dogma um, and her own upbringing and her own preconceived ideas um, and, uh, and also you know, being relentless with her subjects um, and, and, being, and, and the kind of fearlessness of that, but that, and then, but, but to know that she also had this very loving side, right, was um, kind of a surprise uh, and made me feel like she was more human. So it was really nice to go into that. And obviously, I mean, we, did, we haven't even talked about the whole tragedy of yeah. her life later with the back-to-back -back losses of her husband and her daughter, right? Um, and that how she spent the last two decades of her life alone. Um, not not alone. She had friends and other family, but living on her her own, right? 
Um, also, the uh, stoicness <laughs> of, of how she survived that um, was very empowering. Um, And also just that she constantly took on new challenges. And she also, I would say, even though she was she was relentless, for, she also, you know, she had, um, she struggled with uh, serious mental health issues, right? As well as health issues um, for, for many, many years that she wrote about very candidly. And I think that's also one of the reasons that she's a cultural touchstone now mm -hmm. is because she was one of the first persons to you know, say it. I'm in here in lieu of filing a divorce. She published like the psychologist <laughs> report of the, her therapy. I mean, there's things that she kept very private as well. Um, but I think that that also uh, just made me feel okay. Like that it's also, it's okay to be, have been wrong and to acknowledge the ways in which I've been wrong, and to know that I can continue doing work, um, even though maybe some of my early writings I now disagree with. <laughs> right? Yeah, I thought it really, and, and to publicly say that. Yeah. I've been wanting to write a story called uh, To All the Girls I've Hated Before about the negative reviews I've given to some musicians. <laughs> There you go. So, you heard it here first. You should do that. I know. I know. I know. I should. Do we have another question? Oh, okay. Hello. Uh, I'm just curious if you saw the Joan Didion show at the Hammer, and if you did, what you thought of it. Yeah, I, I saw it. I, I saw it three times at the Hammer, and, and then again, it's in, it was in Miami. I actually gave a tour of it in Miami. Um, it's, you know, co-curated by Hilton Owls. Um, the, who was also at the Village Voice when I was there, actually. Um, uh, I, I liked it. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting. And I think maybe because Hilton and I were at the Voice in, in New York at the same time, like he actually highlighted a lot of the things that I felt were really important, like the Central Park story, um, like this, uh, her, her um, conflict with her own past, her self-confrontation. Um, uh, it's, you know, it was a, a little odd, right? You had to really, I think a lot of people didn't understand what it was because it was very conceptual and theoretical. It wasn't, you know, a bunch of Joan Didion memorabilia or pieces that she owned or things that she created. It was pieces that Hilton and the other curator from The Hammer felt um, uh, reflected or you know, spoke to similar issues as her writing, uh, but I liked it. I did. I did too. Good. And next gentleman. Um, thank you for your talk. It was extremely informative, and I really appreciated uh, the passion that informed your research and also your delivery tonight. One thing that I'm interested in and that I've noticed throughout the talk is there seems to be almost a tension that really informs a lot of the writing, which is this on the one hand, uh, confessional nature in her writing, right? writing about the divorce, sharing personal details, alongside what you've alluded to as a shyness or perhaps an evasiveness. Right. Um, and I'm even thinking about her experience in fashion, this combination of confession and evasion, which it informs a lot of fashion publicity and fashion in general. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I have a question, but if you could just comment right. on that tension between right. evasiveness and confession that really seems to track throughout her career. Well, I actually, just to refer back to the question that you had, I, you know, the, the title of that exhibit was What She Means, but then the, the image that they used in all the promotion was a photograph of her with a black turtleneck covering her face. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think that pretty much speaks to it. Yes, I mean, um, uh, again, there's a kind of curation of her image, of, um, to be able to uh, say something about yourself first, then cuts other people off at <laughs> the path, right? It's it's kind of of savvy. Um, I mean, you know, to a degree, she wrote about in that in the piece, the Royal Hawaiian piece, the Life magazine piece. She was she was writing about herself because she had been told she couldn't write about Vietnam, right? <laughs> so there's a, 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 a Thank you. Um, and it's, it's also like a feminist 
political point that she's making there, like, okay, women can only write personal material. Okay, I'm just like gonna lay this out on the line and so you know who I am, yeah. Um, but there is always an element of control when you, when you think of Joan, definitely. Um, sure, go ahead. Um, this is more of a comment. Well, first of all, congratulations, and this is a great talk, and I, as a fellow research nerd, this was very, gobbled it up. But this is kind of a future of journalism story. So as we're, a question, as, we're, as I was looking at the images of the Central Park story and the n notes going back and forth from the editor, and as I was on a Google Doc today with an editor <laughs> accepting changes, and they just, whoosh, they're gone. I mean, not that I am on the level of Didion, but you know, how in the future are we going to see that process and how that dialogue goes on between writer and editor when it just like disappears into the ether? Right, and when the correspondence is all in, in emails and yeah. digital, yeah, I know. I mean, this is a, this is a, a fascinating question for yeah. librarians and, mm -hmm. and archivists. Yeah, I know, I, I, I do. And in a way, I'm grateful mm -hmm. that people are <laughs> asking. <laughs> for God, that someone tries really to write about me. I hope, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I know, um, for like the Susan, Susan Sontag's uh, in the archive at the UCLA library, they also have her computers, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, that. But still, that's just what yeah. saved on yeah. the disks yeah. and the hard drive. Yeah. That's not yeah. Yeah. And the emails and the ether. Yeah, no, it's it's um, it's I, I you know yeah. Yeah, it's future generations are going to have yeah. to to struggle with that. I mean, it, there's the Wayback Machine. There's the the yeah. um, digit, the Internet Archives of yeah. San Francisco that is trying to address that by taking these digital snapshots. But seeing the but kind of back and forth of how a manuscript transforms over time mm -hmm. as, you know. I have to say, I do do what um, Joan said that she did, um, which is I print out yeah. everything, yeah. Uh, the first drafts, and I make right. my notes mm -hmm. in hand, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I yeah. type them. And I actually do uh, save those. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> So, for future generations. I guess for those future generations. For our library. Yeah, right. there you go. I'll be donating those. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be like, One more, last question. Yes. I know that you've written multiple books on women in rock where you focus on multiple different women. Why did you choose Joan Didion as this long form piece? Very good question. <laughs> um, well, because in terms of uh, a, a writer who had influence on me, um, she uh, was one, I mean, she's not the only one, um, to be honest, uh, Bell Hooks, who also died around the same time, uh, was someone that I probably read and taught even more than Joan Didion, um, and I think was equally influential on not just me, but on, on the culture. Um, but I'm probably not the person to write the, the Bell Hooks book, I hope, Someone is out there writing about <laughs> multiple books about bell hooks because those really those books really need to be told. Um, uh, so part of it was just an opportunity. There was an uh, an editor who uh, a, we both had this experience with Joan. Um, it turns out that we actually went to college together and we didn't even know each other. Um, we found out after we'd already started working together. So there was some kind of zeitgeist there. Um, uh, so some of it was, you know, just the opportunity came to do this, and I was like, yes, I would love to write about Joan Didion, um, and I, you know, I went for it. So. And we're glad you did. Thank you. <laughs>